Good morning. It's the greatest thing in the world to be a Christian. Amen. So I think that December is the most wonderful time of the year. When I was a kid, I would have said that too. And if you had asked me as a kid, why is it so great? I would have said presents. And now that I'm an adult, if you ask me why it's the most wonderful time of the year, I would say because of presents, but I'd spell it differently. For many of you in this audience, this may be one of the few times of the year when your work will let you off to go spend time with family. When your kids get married, you have to start negotiating. And I know friends who spend time with one family one Christmas and the other family the other Christmas. But my mother, being very shrewd, moved Christmas at her house to a week later, which means she gets us every year. See, move the date, keep the season. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Presence. But it's also true that all over the world at this time, there'll be people who normally don't think anything about Jesus who'll be hearing his name or seeing something somewhere in a window that will remind them of the most important event that happened when God sent his son into the world. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be reflecting on the significance that's packed into one verse, actually three words, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. And that's going to be our scripture for the next three weeks. Would you please uh, look at the screen and read this verse with me? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Let's enter into worship. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. Can you guess where that great quote comes from? Yes, Kung Fu Panda. No, it is used in Kung Fu Panda, but it goes back to Eleanor Roosevelt. But it's really, really hard to stay in the present. My friend Randy, who lives out in Texas, said one time he met with a student, and while he was talking to the student, whether he was talking or the student was talking, the student was down on his cell phone like this. And when he was talking, he was talking straight down, and when he was listening, he did a bunch of the, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, you know, normal things. And so eventually, Randy reached down under the table and texted his friend. This appears to be the only way to get a hold of you. What would you like to text about? It's hard to stay in the present. And it's not just that we have a hard time focusing. We are hardwired against it. Uh, a man by the name of Gupta wrote a book called Thrive, and in that book mentions that it turns out that we are just made to live in the past or live in the future for survival reasons. 
Think about it. We live in the past because those who don't learn from their history are doomed to repeat it. And so we live in the past thinking about all the things that went wrong so they won't go wrong again. All the ways in which we misstep so we won't misstep again. And we live in the future. Because we have that very important conversation with our boss tomorrow, or that important conversation with our daughter tomorrow, and it's got to be done just right. It can't be done on the fly, because if we get it wrong, we're going to have repercussions for years to come. So we live in the future. And that makes living in the present so rare. And maybe that's why it's a gift. Woody Allen said 80% of success is showing up. And that's probably because so few of of us do. Presence. It's the thing we talk about years after the funeral. I don't remember who bought what flowers. I don't remember what the preacher said in the eulogy. But I do remember that you were there. Presence. It's that thing that we hope for when we get that call, the worst call of our lives. She's not going to make it. You better come to the hospital. Say your last few words. Or if you're in the hospital and you've been told it won't be long now, That's when you want your best friend to cancel all of their appointments and to make the long drive, to be by your side, to hold your hand. You know, technology has given us some wonderful things. I'm amazed and grateful that Grace can now FaceTime Grandma. And I love it that we can send mail that won't just get to their destination in days. Email. I'm grateful for that. But you know, no matter what device we employ, some things you just can't phone in. Bodies sharing life together is what presence is all about. And it was always meant to be plan A. I know some of you have already made your Christmas plans. And I know that for many of us, we'll be sparing, spending life together with people we love. And for others, whether it's because you're employed somewhere or because uh, you're deployed somewhere, you won't be able to get to where you want to go. And so you'll be singing, I'll be home for Christmas, but only in my dreams. And that's plan B. But deep down, we all want plan A. And for God... Bodies sharing life together was always plan A. He grew a garden, a beautiful garden. He loved his garden and he enjoyed it. But there was something even more special coming. He made the animals. Oh, he made some good ones. You know that he chuckled a little and smiled with joy when he made the rabbit tail and the giraffe neck. It's good stuff. But there was something even more special coming. God made people. People in his very image. Image bearers, he calls us. People who would remind the rest of creation what God is like. And he made us different. Wonderfully different. He made us male and female. He made us outgoing and reserved. But he gave us all something the same. Something to identify us to the rest of the world, to house all that we are. He gave us bodies. Bodies with feet to walk and hands to touch. Bodies with noses to smell and ears to hear. Bodies that grow and take up space. Bodies are what keep us from talking about persons as if they're ideas that aren't anywhere. No, a body is where you can point and say, there is Nathan, there. Bodies make us present. Where your body is, is where you are. So if you ever wonder, am I truly present? The first question to ask is, where am I standing? The Bible says that God was standing in the garden. 
And not just that, Genesis 3 and verse 8 says that God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. Now, I want you to enter the story world for a second. The philosophical thinking cat wants to talk about how God is everywhere and present and bodies. Are, God doesn't have a body. We get all that. But enter the story world for a second. You don't say walking unless you're supposed to imagine God stretching his legs on an afternoon stroll. And you don't say cool of the day if you don't mean to imagine the feel of the wind against God's cheek. The language is meant to tell you that God's original plan was sharing life together where your experience of God would be as real as the person sitting next to you. Sharing life. Real presence. That's what God wanted. But you know what happened. Sin entered the story. People began to imagine what it would be like to be God without the shoulders big enough to carry the responsibility. And it led to a sad conclusion. When Adam and Eve heard the sound of God walking in the cool of the day, Genesis 3.8 says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. It became our calling card. Do you remember what happens just a chapter later when Cain kills his brother? He's banished from the presence of the Lord. When Jonah finds out God's called him to leave where he's at and to go to Tarshish, uh, to go to Nineveh, he says, I'm not going to do that. And it doesn't just say he runs the other way. It says he ran from the presence of the Lord. Sin ruined plan A. But God won't give up. Nothing is too hard for the Lord, but there are times in which we need to experience something less than so that we'll appreciate the real thing when it comes. So God switches from plan A to plan B. Moses begged and pleaded for guidance and for companionship. He begged for God not to leave them orphans. And he says, God, may your presence go with us. And God says, yes. Yeah, there's a, you know, there's a cloud by day and a fire by night. But I'll tell you what, moving forward, I'm going to have you build a box. We're going to call it the Ark of the Covenant. And inside... You're going to house the tablets with the very words of God that I gave you. And you're going to house some manna, you know, that bread-like wafer, the bread that gave you life. We're going to put that in the ark. And on the top of it, it says the angels that you build, the golden angels with their wings touching, they're going to overshadow the ark. And I am going to meet you right where those wings touch. We're going to call it the mercy seat. And it's going to sit in the Holy of Holies. And I'm going to bring my cloud and hover over the mercy seat. And there I will meet you. The ark sat in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And to have the ark in your midst was to have God in your midst. So when it came time to build the temple... First Chronicles 22, David orders all the leaders of Israel to help his son Solomon. And he says to them, is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not granted you rest on every side? For he has given the inhabitants of the land into my hands and the land is subject to the Lord and to his people. Now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. Begin to build the sanctuary of the Lord so that you may bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the sacred articles belonging to God into the temple that will be built for the name of the Lord. The temple sat in the heart of the city, and the Holy of Holies sat in the heart of the temple. And there, in the center of the center of the center, set the Ark of the Covenant, 
in the heart of the temple, in the belly of the beast, in the womb of Israel. You could say that. Zephaniah did say that. Speaking to a people war-torn and wearied, he reminded them that the ark is still there. And the promise is still true. The promise looking forward to a day to end all days. And he says, beginning in verse 14, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Rejoice and exult in your heart. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. Now that's good news for the present. God, as represented by the ark, is still with you. Oh, not like it was. Not like plan A. But in plan B, God's form is with you, and that's the reason to rejoice. But wait, nothing is too hard for the Lord. And like my mother, God won't settle for a Christmas card when having the boys around the table is possible. So God announces the hope for a return to plan A. Why should you sing aloud, O daughter of Zion? Why should you rejoice with all your heart? It's not just because the ark is where it is, but because of what God is looking forward to. Notice the change of language beginning in verse 16. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, the Lord your God is in your midst. A mighty one to save. You know, words are powerful things. Poetry does with words what melodies do with notes. It uses them in profound and provocative ways that you wouldn't have seen before. The Hebrew word for in your midst is kedev. It's a general word for with or within. When you want to get to the center of the center of the center, when you want to get to the heart, to the belly of it all, this word will do. When the Israelites were told to wash the whole animal before you sacrifice it, they said, wash the head, wash the feet, wash the tail, wash the legs, and wash the kerev, the inward parts, the bowels, the entrails. Jeremiah says, my heart is within me, and God wanting to change my heart will one day put his law deep down in the inward parts of me. And there's our word, Kenneth. When Zechariah wanted to say that God formed the spirit of man and put the spirit within him, he uses our word. And when Elijah pleads with God to put the soul of a dead child back in his body, he uses our word, Kenneth. It's a word that generically means in or within, but that could literally point to bowels and innards and inward parts. And it's a fitting word for the spiritual relationship between two things. You wash the inward parts of the animal that you would sacrifice to symbolize, I want to be in the congregation. And if you were stuck outside the congregation and you want to be within Israel, you needed something to offer offer to God to recommend and to recognize that that's what you wanted. And you know where I'm going with this. What other word comes to mind when you speak of bowels and belly and inward parts? When Rebecca had twins struggling within her womb, struggling within her, Genesis 25 uses our word, kerev. You know, Sarah, when she was told she was going to have a kid in her old age, the text says she laughed within herself. And then God placed a baby within herself. There's our word. Oh, and in the ancient Jewish world, 
When you referred to a married woman, you'd refer to her as the husband of. It was a virgin that you would refer to as the daughter of. So if I went for the most literal reading, looking back in the light of what we know, I'd see in Zephaniah this message, Fear not, O virgin daughter. Sing aloud. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You shall fear no evil. For the Lord your God is in your womb, the mighty one who will save his people. Could it be? Infertile Sarah laughs within herself as she stands in the presence of the Lord, but then gives birth miraculously to the promised only begotten son. Infertile Hannah, troubled in spirit, prays words that can't be uttered, speaking only in her heart, but gives way to a miraculous birth of Samuel, who spends his days in the presence of the Lord. And Israel, oh Israel, housing in its belly the very presence of God, From you shall come plan A. 600 years later, under the skies on a starry night, a certain Mary opens her mouth and sings. She's a virgin, a daughter from the house of David, and she sings. And why does she sing? Because in Luke chapter 1, Mary is visited by an angel, the angel Gabriel, who says to her, fear not. She says just one chapter later, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for I bring good tidings of great news. But even right there in Luke 1, when she sings, she says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And why is that? Because deep down within you, O daughter of Zion, I will place God himself. You are going to give birth to a son, the Holy One of God, one who is mighty to save. It's plan A. It was always plan A. And just as the Old Testament says that the angel's wings over the Ark of the Covenant would overshadow it, Luke says the Spirit will overshadow you, and deep within you, God will place the Word of God, the bread of life. God in body, walking with us yet again in the cool of the day, and he did walk with us. The word became flesh, and he walked with us. He walked beside the Sea of Galilee, calling his disciples. He walked on the sea, rescuing his people from danger. He walked in the temple courts, challenging his opponents with the message from God. He walked with the lame, who could now walk again. And he told them, walk with me. And he wants to walk with you. But you know what? The garden is not that far away. And neither is the temptation. Just as Adam and Eve no longer wished to walk with God, John 6 says that when Jesus made clear what discipleship involves, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Can you see him? Can you see him? There first in Mary's womb, and then there in the manger. God in a box. Can you see God in the flesh? Can you see his little hands that one day will hold the hand of a leper? And can you see his little toes just aching for the opportunity to one day be able to hit solid ground. And those little hands would one day bear the mark of a nail, and those little toes would one day run toward the cross. He came. He came in body. He came to walk, to be present. And he came for you. Listen to Peter preach in Acts 3 and verse 20. What God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, 
was that the times of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. He would send the Christ appointed for you. And the Apostle Paul tells us that just as God dwelled in Israel and God came to dwell in Mary, even so, God can dwell in you. Because resurrection and the ascension of that same little baby turned into a man means the Spirit of God now overshadows us in our baptism. And Christ comes to dwell in you. And as Paul puts it, Christ in you is our hope of glory. He's Emmanuel. He is. He's with us, not just in Bethlehem, but in Circe, in your pew. And he wants to be in you. This is the moment of decision. Will you let him in? Is there going to be room for him? In the end, when he comes knocking on your door, will you stand with me? Philip Brooks wrote the final stanza to his song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And it was meant to be sung as a prayer. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel.